Hey guys, RC here, back with another RC Reacts. Leeds taking on West Ham at Ellen Road today, and Leeds goes down surprisingly two to one. Uh, surprisingly, I would have, you know, I was thinking this was going to be a win, and I think it might have been a must win game for us. You know, this was a game that we really needed to pull three points from in order to solidify our chances of staying up this year. Because they're a London-based team, and you know Leeds United does not win games in London. So odds are the replay later in the season, we're not going to win that one either, because just because it's in London. So this was a game I felt that we needed to win, and we should have won. But I hate to say it, but I think for the second week in a row, we got outplayed. We got outplayed. And I think we were the dominant team at the half. So for the second week in a row, we really got outplayed in the second half, obviously. So just to hit the, the obvious, 2-1 to one win for West Ham. Leeds United drops points. If we take a look at the table, West Ham goes up, uh, stays in fifth with 20 points with uh, four wins in their last five. Leeds United stuck on 14, it feels like eternally, three losses in their last five. And the real troubling thing here as a Leeds fan, as all these teams below us still have a game in hand, or two in the case of Burnley, if these teams manage to pick up points, then all of a sudden we're in the bottom four or five. And that makes things a lot more tense than I think they have been all season. So I am a little worried about that. Let's talk about a few things of note that I jotted down during the game. And if you see me look down, I'm looking at my phone where I took notes during the game. The last time that Leeds lost a match, a match, home or away, to West Ham was in the year 2000. We had nine wins, not drawing points, but nine wins in a row against West Ham. So that goes by the wayside. Uh, the other thing was, and this was interesting, so today was Marcelo Bielsa's 113th match as manager for Leeds, and that equalizes his longest tenure as a manager for any club. Previously, that was also 113 games for Atletico Bilbao, so his next match will now have him the longest tenured job of his career. So very happy for that. We take a look at the lineups. We went with Meslier in goal. Uh, Stuart Dallas uh, dropped from midfield to the back line. Elioski was in. Cooper was there. Of course, last match against Chelsea, we lost uh, German international Robin Koch and uh, Diego Llorente, the Spanish international. Both are starting and reserve center backs. So Luke Ayling had to move in from the right side to the right cent center mid or center half, and uh, Dallas dropped back there. Calvin Phillips in his standard spot. Rafinha, who has taken over that starting wing role about three weeks ago. Harrison on the left wing. Klitsch in his standard spot. Rodrigo, our record signing Spanish international striker, he gets in in that number 10 role. And uh, it was good to see him back in the lineup. And then Patrick Bamford, our leading scorer up top, sitting on eight goals this season. So that's how we lined up. So the one change was uh, Ailing moving over and then Rodrigo coming in for the injured uh, Robin Koch. And it was great to see Pablo Hernandez back on the bench. He did not play today, but it was good to see him on the bench at least. If we take a look at the stats for the second match in a row, we uh, we had less shots than our opponent. That doesn't happen very often, and that just shows how hard a time we had breaking down West Ham's defense. 7 of 13 on target, so a good percentage. They had 8 of 19 on target. We dominated possession, dominated passing and pass accuracy. You know, you can. Th those are great stats to look at. They look impressive, and they're fun to watch during the match. But at the end of the day, if they're not leading to chances, on-target chances, and conversion of chances, 
I'd rather have three shots, three on target, and win three to one than have 25 shots, four on target, and not score at all. And that's what we're doing lately. So very disappointed in the in the final third is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. But we're playing Bielsa ball. It's living. It's doing what he wants. We're just not able to convert the chances. And look, last year everybody piled on Patrick Bamford. He can't hit hit the side of a barn. I mean, Bamford's got eight goals this year. He led the club last year. I want to say it took all the players a full season to really adjust and adapt to Bielsa's ideas and become comfortable. Even Phillips. Phillips took a huge step forward in that second year. Cooper became an international that second year with Bielsa. You have to remember, Bamford was injured most of that first season. So where everybody else got a year on the pitch learning and perfecting Bielsa's style, Bamford wasn't on the pitch. Bamford did not start until the following year. And so this first year in the Premier League is really Bamford's second full season under Bielsa's guidance. And I think we have seen an improvement in his ability, his conversions, his positioning, creating chances. All the things that we looked for last year, I think, have come to fruition this year because he's been a year behind all the other players. And you got to admit, even Rafinha and Rodrigo, as skilled as they obviously are, have at times looked a little lost or out of place or a step slow because they're still, they're only 12 matches into their careers under Bielsa. So, you know, I think next year we will really see those two start to flourish. I think we'll see it more later this year, and we've already seen some flashes of it already this year just because of how skilled they are. So take that for what it's worth. But that's that's my thinking and my take on Bamford. So let's kind of start looking at my notes on the game. The game sucked. We lost. I'm pissed off. Uh, it is what it is. God, I hope we can win the next one. <laughs> but let's uh, now I want to start diving into the actual minutia and the notes. So our first goal, second week in a row, we scored in the opening minutes. This one came right at the four minute mark. Um, Cooper made a great. And if you if you go back and rewatch it, Cooper made a great drive on a ball. There was a ball played out by West Ham. Cooper made a charge up to the midfield line, inside the circle, but up to the line. Beat the West Ham player to the ball and then had 10 yards of open space that he was able to control the ball, charge into, and then make a through ball through the line into the box for Bamford to run onto. Bamford, if you watch that replay, which I can't show you because NBC will demonetize my video, Bamford started to make the run, saw that Cooper did not make the through ball. He pulled back into an onside position and then made a second run. And I guarantee last year Bamford would have been offsides on that play. Would have been. No doubt in my mind. But again, that's that second year in the system, getting a little more comfortable and a little more fluid in what he's able to do. Controlled the ball, went to take a touch past the keeper, and the keeper was right on him. The keeper came out on the ball, and he took Bamford out. And Bamford drew the, drew the foul for a penalty and a yellow card on the keeper. Bamford would have scored that had he had one more second to take the shot, but the keeper came in and blew him up. Uh, Klitsch stepped up to take the penalty, and uh, Mateus is our penalty taker, um, for better or for worse. Uh, I don't, you know, he seems to be the best guy we have. So he comes up, and he just he just soft-touched it, and the keeper made an easy save. It was right on the ground. The keeper just fell on top of it. It wasn't a challenging shot at all. And for the first time, VAR stood up in Leeds' favor. 
the replay clearly showed the keeper was off the touch line, off his goal line, at the moment the ball, the shot was taken from this penalty spot, and they rightly rewarded Leeds a re-kick. And I get it. If roles had been reversed, we would all be livid and losing our minds. But it was the right call. The replay proved it. Klitsch, to his credit, stepped up, took that shot again, and buried it this time to give us the early one nothing lead. Turned out it turned uh, was the six minute because we had a three minute lapse with all the VAR and the replay and the retake and everything else. But you know we were up one nil, so that was good. Cooper, great, great attack, great through ball. Bamford, a good run and a good attempt, and really did a great job drawing the foul and putting West Ham in a hole and giving us the opportunity. So, you know, Bamford should get an assist on that one. 25th minute, Tomas Susek. Guess how the goal occurred? If you guessed it was a set piece, then by God, you're right. They've got to be the poster team for football manager because set pieces are so overpowered in football manager, have been for years. Leeds United cannot stop a set piece. Very, very rarely. Both goals today were off of set pieces. One was off a corner. One was off a free kick uh, just outside the box, about five yards outside, eh, about 10 yards outside the box maybe. And we couldn't stop either one of them. Now, Robin Koch being out really takes what little height we have off the field. It was one reason I was so glad to get him was because he had height on him. You know, he was over six feet. He had jumping and aerial ability. Nobody else on our club is over six feet tall except for Bamford. And, you know, he's not a defender. He's an attacker. I don't know how tall Cooper is. Cooper's, what, 5'11"? He might be six feet even. But, you know, but I think Koch is like 6'4". You know, so he's the only player we have with any legitimate height in our starting 11 or or off the bench for that matter cuz Shackleton's like 5 foot 6 if I had to guess you know he came off the bench today Pablo's like 5 7 or 5 8 uh he was on the bench Stroik Stroik isn't 6 feet tall I don't believe so we just don't have anybody that can go up air and airily challenge anybody on set pieces and that's why we've gotten burned on these for as long as i've been watching them for three years however i am gonna say as bad as that was for the defense and i believe it was cooper that got beat on that header i blame meslier meslier has not taken much stick this season from Leeds fans and rightly so because he's pretty damn good right 20 years old, one of the leading keepers, the most clean sheets in the Premier League. I get all that. But that goal for Susek was, it was Bailey Peacock Farrell-esque in its failure to try to make a save. I mean, he the ball was not far away from his body. He didn't have to fully extend his arms. He was He was out, you know, basically like this, and he only got one hand on the ball, and he, he flapped it. And, you know, the fact that he didn't go after it with two hands. And you know what? Comparison-wise, there was a shot later in the game in the second half, and he went in full bore, two-fist punch, and just sailed the ball out of there. You know, if he would have gone after that with a little more gusto, I, I have to believe he could have saved that ball. Rafinha made a great effort to clear it off the line, much as Ailing did for a ball a few weeks ago. But he was in the net. He actually did clear it, but he was in the net. So there was nothing he could have done. Klitsch had another opportunity. He had a really great cross. Rodrigo Rodrigo took the header from the right near the spot. Uh, it, it came into the spot. Klitsch had a great cross. Rodrigo was charging onto it, but the keeper came out, made a play on the ball beat Rodrigo to it and ended that. But that was it was a really nice build up of play, a very precise pass by Klitsch and Rodrigo 
you know, I was sitting there going, get to the ball, just a step. Not, I'm not even going to stay a, say a step slow, just the keeper beat him to the spot, you know. So uh, the other note I had for the first half, we, we looked really open, wide open for the first 30 minutes. And then the last 15 minutes, we were by far the better team, stronger team, taking a lot of possession, chances, and just couldn't get anything to fall. Bielsa is never shy about pulling the trigger on a substitution, and he wasn't again today. Harrison struggled a little bit on the wing. Alioski has, you know, not been the greatest. He hadn't been bad, but, you know, there's be, there's a difference between being really, really good and just being average. And Harrison and, and Alioski, the left side of our attack, were both bang on average today. Uh, nothing glaring. Uh, you know, Harrison was on the ball. Alioski had a couple of opportunities. And, you know, they gave that, you know, I have no doubt those two guys of anybody on the roster give 100% effort every time they're on the pitch. I have no doubt about that. But Harrison has looked a little out of form the last two or three matches. And Alioski really got abused a little bit last match by Chelsea. And I think they were, you know, that was coming to light again, possibly. So Bielsa pulled the trigger. Jamie Shackleton is was back from injury and on the bench today. So that was good. I like Jamie Shackleton. I'm looking forward to one or two years from now where he's a regular in our starting 11 because I think he brings a lot to the table with his vision, his attacking ability. Uh, he made some really good runs where he, you know, he, he provided overlap and pressure in the box, op you know, an opportunity in the box for, for a pass or a through ball. And uh, he looked really good today. So he came on for Alioski, and then he and Dallas flipped sides. Dallas moving to the left, Shackleton moving to the right, which is both of their, I think, nor you know, normal positions. Helder Costa came on. I was a little surprised by that, but I, I guess Bielsa felt Costa needed some match time because he hasn't played in a few matches. I was kind of thinking he he's showing a inkling to go to, to Paveda, and Paveda has looked pretty good, uh, undersized, able to be bullied off the ball, but he's looked really dangerous and an attacking mindset. But this may be one of those situations where Paveda is still in that formative period, and he's very young, and maybe Bielsa wanted to make sure he had somebody that understood the attacking and defensive concepts. So we replaced the whole left side at the half. We had a really big start to open the second half. Uh, Shackleton was showing a lot of his flair with the ability to control the ball move into an attack space, distribute. Uh, not as good as Calvin Phillips from a distribution standpoint, but I think Shackleton is a really bang-up player, and I, I like him a lot. He's he's probably one of my favorite players. I think next year's kit might be a Shackleton kit for me. He, he took a shot or he played a ball. It got bounced back. He picked it up, controlled it played another ball into the box, got this one to Bamford in front of the goal, granted with people around him and between him and the goal. He had a turnaround snapshot opportunity, and the ball went just wide of the goal. I thought the ball was going to go in. Uh, you know, probably a, if he would have taken that shot against Villa, it was probably in the net. Uh, but today, and what's the deal with Bamford? He's got eight goals, but seven of them are on the road and only one at home. He just can't seem to score at Ellen Road. And there's no fans there to get on him. So that's the odd thing. I also made a note right there. Ailing looked really solid at center back at that point. Uh, Declan Rice, this was interesting. Declan Rice from West Ham uh, took a ball, much like Cooper's in midfield, drove into the attacking end, and there was a clashing of English international midfielders, 
as Rice was in possession, Calvin Phillips came in on defense and knocked the ball away from Rice. I was like, there's a win. Uh, that's why Calvin needs to be starting for England. Uh, if they, you know, if uh, Southgate could play the right tactic and players. Another question I wrote down in the second half, do any of the announcers or media in the Premier League do any type of research on the new teams before they open their mouth and look like a horse's butt? I'm going to guess the answer is no, because every week, every week, there's somebody saying, Leeds play at such an accelerated pace, there's no way they can keep that up for a whole match or for the whole season. Or, you know, there's you know, they're gonna burn out and this is Beals' shortcoming. And I think there was one year where, where Beals' team fell apart down the road. Was it at Villarreal maybe or something like that? But don't they realize this is the, that we've already done it for two years in the championship? And while the Premier League is higher quality teams and players, don't they realize that you play 38 matches in the Premier League and you play 46 in the championship? They've done it for two years over more games. This year is going to be a cakewalk to keep up their Bielsa fitness. I don't think any Leeds fan is worried about it. And these are the same, you know, like the guys, well, Bielsa, I don't know why, he can't speak English. He's not, he's not English or American. And where he's from, they don't speak English. If you go to Argentina, are you going to speak English? Probably, because that's your native tongue. Hello, you know. And the, the funny thing is, these are the same, this is the same bullshit we've heard from announcers and, you know, Sky Sports and media that don't cover leads regularly for two years. And now we're hearing it again because these idiots haven't watched Leeds and haven't done their research to know that that's a stupid-ass question. Because Joe or whoever the guy, guy was, uh, can Leeds fitness levels, can they keep them up through a whole season? This is pretty brutal, the pace they're upholding. Yeah, whatever. At the 60-minute mark, I noted, I mentioned earlier, first match with Rodrigo and Rafinha, both in the starting eleven. They were pretty quiet today. Rodrigo had some really poor touches on the ball, I thought. Uh, Rafinha didn't show some of the flair and vision that he saw that he showed in the last couple of matches. They're certainly great players, and they're going to come good, but it just wasn't there today. Uh, we had another opportunity late in the. Uh, First half in the second half, uh, Klitsch got a. There was a corner. We had a corner. There was a rebound. Uh, Klitsch took a nice attempt. It came out to him uh, outside the box. He took a shot from long range, and uh, it was on target. Keeper for West Ham made a brilliant save. I was really impressed by that one. And if you go back and look at that one, for those of you that like to diss Patrick Bamford, even the announcer noted. Watch Bamford on that play. When the ball, when the shot came in, Bamford was on sides and he trailed the ball into the keeper. If the keeper would have flubbed that ball any at all, Bamford would have been in there for a putback. So those are the things that Bielsa has said for three years now that he loves about Patrick Bamford. So uh, Bamford may have run out of gas, but you know he puts in a huge work rate every game. Uh, they uh, they pulled him off in the 74th minute. I was kind of surprised they brought Tyler Roberts on. I'm not a big Roberts fan. I mean, I like Roberts, but that's not who I think. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not smarter than Bielsa, so you know that was obviously the right call to make. But I was thinking they were going to move Rodrigo up into the striker position and bring in another midfielder, Pablo Hernandez or somebody like that. It would have been nice to see Pablo to see if between him and you know if he could unlock something uh, in the second you know waning minutes of the match, put the Spanish international up in the striker role where he could try to get a finish and an equalizing goal. Um, 
But we brought Tyler Roberts on and uh, didn't see much out of him. Uh, and I would say I didn't see much out of him like I normally don't see much out of him. Um, not a bad kid, and I think he's got a lot of upside. He's still extremely young. What is he, 22, I think? So, you know, he's got he's got plenty of time to develop. But uh, is it Forwald? Is that the guy's name uh, for West Ham? Uh, he had a counter. He had a chance. He came up on the right, got a ball. Cooper came out real aggressive and strong, did a slide tackle and missed and ended up and there was rain coming down some mist coming down in the second half and cooper went sliding about five yards past uh four walled and he took it in and again if you haven't watched that replay go back and watch it cooper bounces up to his feet and goes full tilt trying to recover and he got in and made another made another tackle knocking the ball out, giving them another corner. But, you know, it did, you know, he really showed heart trying to get back there. Coops took a bad angle on the ball, but again, great recovery, great work ethic and effort to get back on that ball. There was an interesting attempt. It didn't convert to anything, but West Ham had a set piece. Melier came out and did the, the, uh, the punch on the ball. It went out and... Was it Haller? Uh, it's this guy in the picture. I think his name is Haller. I'm not a West Ham fan. The only one I, I, I really know is Declan Rice and Jared Bowen. So, um, big Jared Bowen fan, by the way. I like him. Wish he didn't play against Leeds. Uh, but anyway, uh, he had a bicycle kick to really set up uh, a nice opportunity. It was on target. It was hard. He drove it in. And... Th- Meslier, as bad as his save opportunity was on that Susek goal, this was a stellar save. Bicycle kick low to his right. Uh, he went down and he had to he had to hit it with everything he had to, to save it. And then at the 80th minute, another free kick. I believe it was Costa that gave up the foul uh, for the free kick. And as I noted. Robin Koch is the only height we've had on this club outside of Pontus Janssen for three years. Last year, we had no height. The year before, we had Pontus, and that was it. And this year, we signed Koch, and he's out injured. So basically, we've got an average height of somewhere around five foot seven, I would guess, maybe 5'8", with Bamford throwing the numbers off. But... Uh, we couldn't defend it and um, got beat at the back post. It was, uh, what was that guy's name? Agbana, one of their center backs. Looks like he's about 6'4", 6'3", 6'4". Uh, he goes up, makes a powerful header at the back post, leaves Meslier just staring at it, and that put us down in that 2-1 hole. We had one last opportunity in the final two minutes of regular time. Uh, Rodrigo had a ball come in. It was a nice cross to him. I for, I didn't write down who did the cross, but um, really nice ball into him, and he got a head on it. Solid header, but he didn't get any force behind it. Uh, it looks like you know, and even the announcer said it looks like he tried more of a deflection than putting pace on the ball, and it went right to the keeper, and it was an easy save, and that left us uh, scrambling for stoppage time and we couldn't make anything happen. So to sum everything up, we are going to miss our center backs. Koch is out for three months with surgery on his knee. Urente strained, uh, had a muscle strain again. And I think Bielsa had alluded he wasn't a hundred percent. He really wasn't ready to come back. He wanted to give him some U23 matches to make sure he was a hundred percent fit and ready to go. But the Koch injury in the tenth minute against Chelsea kind of forced the issue. Kind of surprised we didn't go with Stroik. But again, Ailing did a great job there. But you know, the less you have to move pieces around, I think the better, in my opinion. But Ailing did a great job, and he'll probably be back there next week. But So we're without Koch for three months. 
Uh, Urente is going to be several weeks, so probably not until January will he even effort to come back. And we may have to see him go through some rehab and U23 matches to get fitness, uh, having to go down on the sh- you know go on the shelf again so quick. Is Pablo Hernandez ever going to play again for Leeds United? He did get his way back on the bench. Uh, I never heard an official thing. You know, we know we had that kind of issue with Bielsa when he was pulled off uh, and threw through his um, war memorial armband. I think it was something along those lines. Um, he did apologize, but we also know Bielsa takes that stuff pretty seriously. I, I, I think Pablo is great. He is past his prime. But I think the wizard may still have some tricks in the bag, and that's why I thought maybe he would come on late today and move Rodrigo up into the striker spot. So I hope we haven't seen the last of Pablo. I hope you know. I hope he he comes back and plays a role in in our first season back in the Premier in in sixteen years. But we're gonna miss we're gonna miss our two two center backs. It's gonna be rough having that height. I think we have shown again that we are flawed against set pieces, and we're gonna to have to be very cognizant of that and not be so quick to give away fouls deep in our area that put balls into the box from near range. Because that could be that could be disastrous for us coming up. If we take a look at the rest of the season, we've got Newcastle at home, Man United at Old Trafford, Burnley at home, and West Brom. Again, I, I was hoping we would win this game, but if we can pull nine out of our next four matches. I think that would be a success. Wins over Newcastle, Burnley, and West Brom. And it would be great to to pull points from Man United as well. Here's a question for you guys. Would you take three points against United if we drop points in the other three matches? There was a question posed on the uh, the YEP podcast uh, yesterday. Um, If you were guaranteed a 5-1 win but we could not get fans back into the stands this season. Would you take that? And uh, Joe Urquhart said yes. Um, (laughs) I was like, well, okay. I can't really comment on that because I'm an American. I live in America. I'm never going to make it to Ellen Road in my lifetime. Never say never, but probably not. Um, You know, just it's, you know. I'm happy watching them on TV. I would love to be there, but there's plenty of things I'd love to do stateside that I haven't done in my lifetime. So anyway, just wondering what your thoughts on that. If you could get a win over Man United, but lose all three of the other matches the rest of this year, would you would you take that? A guaranteed win in exchange for three losses. I would say no. I would say no. I don't care if it's Man United or not. I'd rather take three wins and a loss to them as big a rival as they are. But three wins and a draw? I'd be happy with that. But we've got to get some points here, guys. We have got to get some points. And uh, I'm excited about the Tottenham game. Uh, I've got a guy that subscribes to my YouTube channel that is a big Tottenham fan. So looking forward to that on January 2nd. Crawley Town? That's going to be interesting. You know, we we tend to flub these these games that we should win. We'll see how that goes. And then, of course, looking ahead uh, to the Ben White Derby against Brighton, January 16th. We've got to go on a run here, man. We have got to, I mean, Tottenham's, you know, I would say Tottenham's probably a loss. Southampton, Brighton, Newcastle. Winnable games. Leicester, I think we played them. You know, we we can compete with them. I mean, they beat us four to one, but we can compete with them. 
I don't think we were played off the pitch in that one. Everton, we've already shown that we can win. Palace, winnable. Arsenal, winnable. My take after the first half, you know, as we're nearing the end of the first half of the season, there's really nobody that I've seen so far that we can't be at least competitive with. I mean, Man City, Liverpool, Arsenal, Everton, we've played them all hard. And those are the cream of the cream. You know, those are top-level teams in the Premier League. I don't think there's a single team on here that we would go into a match being deathly afraid of. Chelsea has shown them to be a step above. And I think Tottenham's going to show themselves to be a step above, if I'm being honest, which I take pride in doing, uh, that I do take off my Leeds tinted glasses when I do these uh, reviews. This one has gone a little long, but I had a lot of notes from today. Normally, I just go off the cuff, but there was a lot today that I wanted to cover. Uh, so, hope you guys enjoyed it. I will talk to you guys after the next match, which will be next Wednesday. Not looking forward to that day personally because I think my boss is coming into town. So, I will have to record the game, watch it when I get home. And uh, so expect that edition of RC Reacts to be a little late. So uh, anyway, that's how it goes. Have a good one, guys. Take care. Bye.